the very strange powder you see behind me, is something that's become a kind of a fundamental conflict at the heart of modern civilization. These are rare earth elements, and specifically praseodymium, cerium, lanthanum, neodymium, samarium, and gadolinium. Specialized materials that, as you might be aware, have become central to various political agreements and to a lot of political machinations. And that's because these materials are used in almost every piece of advanced technology we use today and, as of 2025, have become pivotal in the quest to find cleaner, greener and more sustainable way to produce energy. But, as you're probably also aware, right now China seems to control the production of most of these elements. And they're not really doing it in a very clean way. But trying to find a more sustainable and more importantly, more environmentally friendly way of producing these elements has actually become a recent scientific pursuit for quite a few teams out there. And so in this video we're going to be discussing some of the most recent research about this and some of the more bizarre discoveries from the plant kingdom and also certain bacteria. But before we discuss the research, I guess so let's discuss so what exactly is this and why do we need it so much? And the reality is that the name rare earth elements is a bit of a misnomer. It essentially refers to 17 different elements from the periodic table, and well, pretty much none of them are rare. As a matter of fact, things like lanthanides, yttrium, and scandium are extremely common, and cerium is even more abundant than copper. But they are called rare because they're kind of difficult to extract. As a matter of fact, here's a map of where you can usually find these elements, but extremely clever move in China back in the 1980s resulted in China becoming number one in global production of these oxides. And that's because China found a way to extract them relatively easily and established all of the necessary logistics required for a continuous production and continuous supply. And so even though most of these elements are usually found in very thin and somewhat dispersed trace amounts, basically representing impurities inside various minerals, China found a way to extract them and purify them, producing enormous quantities over the years. But most other countries pretty much ignored it until now, which is why in 2025 rare earth elements have become a relatively hot topic. And so right now there are very few sources that can obtain these elements in any economically feasible way. And the reason these elements are so important is mostly because they possess very specific magnetic properties. They're actually some of the most essential building blocks for a lot of very powerful magnets we use today. And a lot of this is used in clean energy. For example, neodymium iron boron magnets are up to 10 times stronger than any other magnets we use, and so they're actively used in both electric vehicles and, of course, wind turbines. And a single wind turbine can use up to 600 kilograms of these materials. Likewise, they're also vital for a lot of advanced electronics, mini computer components, high-end camera lenses, fiber optics, and even most of the smartphones we use today all use at least some of these elements inside. But for the US, they're also important for military technologies, because a lot of high-precision systems use them in almost every component. And so, in just the last few years, the demand for these elements have dramatically increased. And it's mostly driven by the transition to renewable energies and, of course, electric vehicles. But this growth also presents us with a bit of a problem. Environmental problem, because extracting this stuff can be very environmentally damaging. As a matter of fact, it does produce quite a lot of very dangerous toxic waste, including some radioactive waste that's extremely difficult to get rid of. And though right now this is mostly a problem in China, if other countries decide to mine this and produce their own rare earth elements, well, this is definitely going to be bad news for the environment. Which is why a lot of teams are trying to find a cleaner and more efficient way to try to extract this by possibly using some kind of a biotechnology and specifically using plants and microorganisms. And well, I guess so let's start with this new study that just came out that surprisingly does discover something super cool inside one of the plants. And it basically involves an extremely promising mining technique referred to as phytomining, sometimes also referred to as agromining. This concept involves using plants, specifically those known as hyperaccumulators, to try to pull out a lot of different metallic compounds, especially heavy metals, from inside the soil. And these plants naturally possess special compounds that bind with specific metal ions. And in principle, this concept doesn't just not cause any environmental damage, it obviously improves the environment, because now we have plants producing actual ecological systems that can also benefit other life as well. But at the moment the commercial viability for this has been kind of limited. Mostly because this is a slow, inefficient process, 
and does take at least several months to pay off. But this recent study from 2025 highlights a somewhat incredible discovery that we've never seen anywhere. A new pathway that seems to be more powerful and more efficient than we've seen previously. Here this focuses on a fern referred to as Blacknum orientali, which has already been known as a very active hyperaccumulator capable of collecting a lot of rare earth elements. But this new discovery is truly remarkable. Because here scientists discovered that this fern was not just collecting this stuff, it was actually growing rare earth crystals inside its tissues. And so here, by using powerful imaging, scientists observed rare earth rich compounds, specifically monazite, accumulating as a kind of a chemical garden inside the plant, with many of these crystals self-organizing and containing a lot of different elements including neodymium, lanthanum and cerium. And this is the first time scientists have seen this in any plant. This essentially reveals some kind of an alternative pathway to produce monazite mineralization and that actually seems to be done in normal conditions without anything else required. And normally monazite is produced using extreme heat and extreme pressure and usually forms deep underground. And just to, I guess, explain this very quickly, monazite is an extremely important source of rare earth elements, making this one of the most important discoveries in terms of phytomining. Here is one of these rocks discovered in Bolivia. And so this discovery potentially finally makes phytomining way more efficient than actual geological mining. Mostly because in this case these plants are able to create something that would otherwise require extreme conditions underground and would also require drilling, blasting and using harsh chemicals to extract. Yet here these plants are able to do this without anything by just growing on the surface. And so here the commercial potential for this idea may actually work. But we're not going to know until someone actually tries. And right now there seem to be only a few startups that basically are trying phytomining, but they're mostly focusing on nickel. No one has actually done monazite yet. But honestly, this is a really promising idea. And if that doesn't work, we have bacteria. Although here this is not called phytomining, and instead is referred to as bioleaching or biomining. And so this year we also had a few studies about biomining that did have some progress. For example, Cornell researchers published a series of papers discussing one breakthrough involving a small but mighty bacterium referred to as Gluconobacter oxidans. The bacterium that seems to contain at least two superpowers. First of all, it seems to be able to safely extract rare earth elements and other critical elements and store it inside its body. But second of all, it can also capture carbon dioxide. And so here in a series of papers, scientists discuss several major breakthroughs, focusing on what this bacterium can do and how we could potentially even use it in order to extract elements and even capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere. And so for seven years, scientists have been optimizing this bacterium to efficiently dissolve rocks. And this is actually not a new discovery and not even a new method. And that's because the idea behind microbial mining is already actually used. For example, approximately 25% of copper extraction is already done through this bioleaching process. It usually relies on microbes that use either iron or sulfur for energy. But in this case, this bacterium is what's known as a heterotroph and converts sugars like glucose into a mineral dissolving liquid referred to as a biolixiviant, something that's mostly made out of organic acids and something that seems to be pretty effective at extracting rare earth elements from various minerals. And actually even from waste materials, like for example old smartphones. And so here in 2025 scientists focused on trying to maximize the efficiency of this bacterium by mostly conducting genetic engineering and by optimizing the extraction process. And they did find quite a few different ways to improve this bacterium and make it super efficient at all of this. For example, by editing its genome that seemed to accelerate the acid production inside this bacterium, they managed to increase the efficiency of bioleaching by up to 73%. Here this involved a deletion of one gene and an overexpression of a different gene. They also realized that this bacterium seems to use more than just acid to get metals out of rocks. And so here they discovered 89 additional genes that seem to produce additional chemical reactions, such as creating various complexes between metals and organic compounds that seem to increase efficiency even more. And in some strains this resulted in 111% efficiency. 
basically accelerating this process dramatically. And surprisingly, this also resulted in what's known as bioaccelerated weathering, basically removing CO2 from the air and turning it into rocks. And so here, by interacting with what's known as a ultramafic minerals, minerals that have a lot of magnesium and iron, they were able to accelerate the production of limestone, which is what usually happens when CO2 is added to various minerals and is removed from the air. And what's surprisingly, the use of this bacterium accelerates this natural process by approximately 58 times. And so this kind of presents us with a very interesting twofold solution, removal of CO2 and the extraction of these very critical and important elements. But there's obviously still a bit of a hurdle, and mostly in regards to the cost of sugar feedstock, or basically the fuel for these microbes. And this is usually created from crops like sugarcane, sugar beet or corn, and is used in a lot of industries to, for example, produce sugar, but to also produce biofuels, such as, for example, ethanol, or in a lot of reactions requiring fermentation. And at the moment, for this particular reaction, the overall amount of sugar feedstock required is just a little bit too high. Or at least it was too high initially. But through genetic engineering, once again, scientists were able to reduce this dramatically and actually drop it by approximately 500 times. Which means that one day this could become an extremely efficient and relatively cheap process to essentially extract a lot of rare earth elements while also dramatically reducing CO2 levels in the air. Especially if scientists find an effective way to use some kind of agricultural waste, such as cellulose biomass, as the feedstock for these bacteria. And well, what these recent discoveries show us is that there is definitely a lot of new, renewed interest in trying to figure out how we can actually do this mining process without the hassle and the pollution that's usually produced. And though this unique crystallization mechanism is definitely exciting, right now this process is definitely in its infancy. We don't really know how effective this is, we just know that it seems to work. But in contrast, using the gluconobacter oxidants may actually be super efficient and may result in the emergence of viable alternatives even in the next few years. And so here we have some really exciting scientific solutions to at least two pressing economic and environmental issues. Being able to extract rare earth elements and reducing the amount of CO2. And though this is still just a proof of concept and has not been tried on a large scale, both phytomining and biomining are definitely really exciting concepts and hopefully will become a lot more prominent because they're definitely a lot more environmentally friendly. But once there are some additional discoveries or once someone else discovers another exciting way to extract rare earth elements, we'll come back and discuss this more in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM it directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access. You can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.